The rebellion and exodus of the sons compelled the Atlanteans to return to their drawing boards. They began a second major hybridization program and created a Mark II being that we can call Adamic. These beings were of both sexes, uh, but in the beginning they could not reproduce. They made excellent servants in the garden. Ancient chronicles, ancient texts, and sources. We know that when the conquistadors got to South America, you know, uh, Zamaraga and uh, these uh, bishops and cardinals were just burning and desecrating the ancient chronicles all over the world, but they especially did it in South America. I want to share with you a caption from a Mexican codice. It's one of the remaining books, and it's the Popol Vuh. It's one of only two, like the Dresden Codex, the Popol Vuh. I think that's about it, basically, that survived. I want to read this with you, and again, if this is any example of what these many burned books contained, and I do believe it is, we can understand why they were burned. The Popol Vuh says, and this is the God speaking, let us make him who shall nourish and sustain us. What shall we do to be invoked, to be remembered in earth? We have tried with our first creatures, but they, uh, we could not make them venerate us. So then let us try to make obedient, respectful beings who shall nourish and sustain us. Now the question immediately arises, why would gods need uh, you know, servants to nourish and sustain them? And what's this bit about the first creatures who wouldn't and the second ones who would? If this is an example of what was in those ancient books, we have now a, a handle on why it was so important for the ruling dynasties of the more, you know, later times to get rid of them. Same thing happened in Ireland, desecrations untold. And not only of books. In the Babylonian account, man is to be merely a slave brought into being by Marduk at the plea of the defeated rebel gods, so that those gods themselves need not be subjugated to servile labor. Man would be a puppet, a lowly primitive creature. The epic of Atrahasis, which dates to about 1630 BC, found in the Assyrian Library of Nineveh, I'm sure Zachariah Sitchin knows all about that book. He, it says that in a similar vein to the Enuma Elish, one of the main ideals is to show why man was created by the gods. It was so that they themselves need not work on the earth to produce their own food. Now, the alien geneticists did not desire a repeat of their first experiments. They realized that the error, you see, the first time, the error had centered on the intelligence of their Mark I experiment. Therefore, in the Mark II experiment, Adamic man's intelligence would be confounded. Adamic man's intelligence would be confounded. Well, we hear about that, but we don't know we're reading it. Because the euphemism that has been used for that state of dumb downness is the word naked. So just remember, when you read the word naked in the Bible or the other apocryphal works, that Adam and Eve were sent into the garden naked, please understand that it is a euphemism for being in a state of intellectual, psychological ignorance. It, means not, it doesn't make any sense in the world to think of it uh, you know, as physical nakedness. They were in a dumbed-down state. Well, listen, you can sit in a laboratory now, you know, or half an hour, and they'll stick a few probes in your brain, and you'll be, you'll be naked, you'll be dumbed-down. They can do it in half an hour. Think what you could do if you're at the power of the genome and the cell and the mitochondria. <sighs> no problem. Genesis 3 says, By the sweat of thy face will be thy bread. This is God, by the way. This is your, your God talking to his creations. By the sweat of thy face will be thy bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust thou art, and to dust thou wilt return. They give you the same line when they're putting you in the, in the, dirt, in the dirt now. When you go to a funeral, perk up, listen to that. And listen to the condescension that's behind it. My father died, he's not dust. Your parents have died, they're not dust. Who is this that calls our parents and the fallen of our planet the dust? Genesis 11 says, and the, and the Lord said, Look, the people are united and they all have but one language. Come on, let us go down and therefore confound their language so that they cannot understand one another's speech. Again, this is an oft-quoted and oft-researched passage. But it, the language is not verbal. Right? This is the language of the chemical soup. Now, thank God, we've, you know, we've, we've come far. We can look back at this and understand it. This is the symbiotic, spiritual language that's being confounded. Genesis 3.22, and that number 3.22 is a very important number to secret societies, by the way. In Genesis 3.22, and the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Now, lest he put forth his hand to take off the tree of life, we better get down there and do something. This is an implication that the first cre creatures did have full knowledge of good and evil,
but this time that would not be permitted. So they, you know, had to do something. That term tree of life, by the way, is a term that relates to the DNA. DNA was known in the ancient times. I know most people don't believe that that's possible, but it, it was. The only thing was that they did not, you know, portray or think of DNA as this sort of weird Lego set floating in hyperspace that they per perpetually show you today on TV. They had a much more organic notion of it. It was a tree of 22 branches and roots with its, you know, roots in the earth and its branches in the heavens. It's the same symbol on the two coiling serpents because they understood that it had a serpentine look. And this is probably a good juncture as to explain why the term serpent was used. It's not because they look like serpents. They look humanoid. The Semitic word for serpent is Nahash. And that word also has a second meaning of, of discovery, to find out. So evidently this refers to science. Therefore the Nephilim were super scientists. And the term serpent stuck because that's what it means. Because under the microscope they've actually looked at it. And the, the DNA helix looks like a serpentine shape. Therefore those who were the scientists, as the medical profession and conglomerates still use today, the caduceus of Hermes, right? Those who had the knowledge of that would wear the logo or be called the serpent people. Not because they had scales and looked like serpent people. In Genesis 2 it says, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You see on the God who's doing this, you see what? The twin serpents of the DNA. You always see that if you look at the great mythologies of the world. The Indian shamans, Native American shaman, using the double the serpents. In that previous picture, you not only saw the twin serpents, but you saw this thing that all the gods of Egypt hold. It's called the Ankh. And everybody, but everybody's got a theory about the Ankh. You know, it's meant to be breath, it's meant to be life, it's meant to be the union of opposites. And of course that's true. But actually, ancient people like Hebrew and the ancient languages did not use vowels. So we have many words come down to us that use only strong consonants, or what would have passed for consonants. consonants. The word Ankh, by the way, if you add in the other sound values, is actually the word Anu, right? N-K, Nakhi. So just know from now on that the Ankh, if, you're, if you see the God holding the Ankh, it literally is the composite word of the word Anunnaki, which is known as the word for the fallen angels, or the, the gods from on high, Ananaje, the heavenly serpents. So that, that's what the Ankh really stands for. But we find serpent symbols all over the place. We find them in the modern milieu as well. We find words of power that we don't, don't mean anything in English, but until you discover what is being said. What is the serpent that encoils euroborically? What is the pentium, the room of the five? Or the serpentium? We have symbolism that has always troubled me. We've got Knights of Templar crosses, Maltese crosses. We've got green, green dragons crowned, devouring human beings. Where do these symbols come from? Why are they being used? The, the, the uh, Italian Prime Minister Berlusconi, here's his house. Instead of having a, you know, a paddling pool for the kiddies out in the front garden, no, he prefers a black serpent eating a human being. <laughs> I'd love to hear the story that he tells you when you ask him, uh, you know, hey mate, why you, why you got that you know, black serpent in the garden that's eating a fella, you know? He goes, oh, you know, it's a tattoo. <laughs> But the fact of the matter is, even the positioning of these people's houses are on special vortexes. There's a subject that's very important to understand related to archaeoastronomy and, and, and geomancy about why, like the ancient fathers did this. They put symbols in the earth, did they not? Well, it's happening again. Freemasonry, uh, we looked at the compass and the G earlier on, and of course researchers are always telling you the G represents, oh, it's God, it's Gaia, it's geometry. No, it's not. The lowercase g, when it's done like that, is a little cryptic anagram for the serpent. That's why it's there. Because the Masons, now being infiltrated and so forth, right, are doing the work. That's why George, there's lots of kings called George. The Georgus, St. George and the dragon. Right? George and the dragon, not James and the dragon or Johnny and the dragon. It's George and the dragon. Because the g is important. Don't believe me? Think I'm making it up? They're happy to tell you. There is the serpent, g in connection to the gene trust. And they're asking you to be a part of history. Yeah, their history. But we have to get symbolically literate because they're showing you ancient symbols out of the world of religion and theocracy and theology, right? 
always when they're dealing with high